All right. Hey, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our last webinar, Unleashed WD webinar of 2013. I'd like to introduce everybody to our guest, the author, my friend, the author of Compete Smarter, Not Harder, Professor Bill Putzis. Bill is coming to us. I'm in Chicago. Bill's coming to us from the Verizon headquarters in Basking Ridge, New Jersey, where he was on a flight at 5.45 a.m. this morning out of Raleigh. Bill, good morning. Welcome, man. Good morning, Dirk, and uh, great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Bill, I am so excited that you are here with us um, to talk about your book, uh, Compete Smarter and Not Harder. Um, I mentioned to you when we were planning for it, I've read the book from cover to cover. Here is my printout Can you, of, from my iPad of all my highlighted notes and, um, you know, the notes that I took. So great, great book, great stories of, of business, um, great business processes that I know you're going to talk to us about and some great tools that people can walk away with. So really excited to, to uh, share with our community and your community. Uh, your great expertise. So again, welcome, man. Thanks, Dirk. Yeah. So Bill, as you and everybody else knows, that is that at Unleashed WD, we are just very, very interested in uh, raising the spirit of innovation throughout wholesale distribution and um, their channel partners, you know, helping them find new and better ways to deliver value um, throughout the supply chain and uh, to their customer base. And as we're going through this research, Bill, you know, one of the things that we continually hear, hear from uh, CEOs, if you will, and business leaders is they complete continue to talk to us about the change, right, that is impacting their businesses on a day and, and big macro changes that we haven't faced before. And this change is coming at us, not necessarily from inside the organization. It's coming at us from outside the organization and it's coming at us fast. And as I'm hearing that with all the research I'm doing, I'm thinking about one particular observation you make in this book that, by the way, I highlighted the living daylights out of, and you see it up on the screen. And, and what you say in the book is that we are experiencing this fundamental change, the speed and the magnitude of which is impacting businesses in ways we've never seen before. Uh, I certainly am, am hearing the same thing. I think everybody on the call can agree with that. But then you say this, this this fundamental change, you see it as providing a once in a lifetime opportunity for businesses. That is a phenomenally optimistic view. I love optimism. I think I'm an optimistic. Would you just quickly, before we get into your book in depth, tell us your thinking about you see all this change as a once in a lifetime opportunity. I love it. So, so let me build on this. Hopefully you can hear me okay. Is this coming across? Yeah, it's good. The no. started to get slow. Can you hear me good? I can. Right, awesome. I, uh, it's funny. I just spent uh, the morning with Verizon talking about change in this industry, changing more rapidly than others. And one of the things I did is I put on a pair of the Google Glass, if, if those of you know, or if, if you can go and do a little bit of uh, searching on Google Glass as an example of how things are changing. I believe if you go back to the Industrial Revolution and then you were to fast forward a hundred years in the future from now, the period that we're experiencing right now yeah. is perhaps the most interesting, the most opportunistic, the most exciting time in the history of business. I'll even say it's stronger than once in a lifetime. It's once in a many lifetime opportunity. And many of the reasons for that is if you take the convergence of technology, of information, ubiquity, always on, the mobility and the interconnected nature of information is presenting opportunities for productivity and change in ways we've never ever seen before. And I'll throw out one real quick figure Please. that has stuck with me is that just five years ago, BlackBerry had a greater market share than Apple and Samsung combined in smartphones. In less than five years, they've gone from that to a 4% market share shrinking and not clear that they're going to be in business in the next five to 10 years. That's how quickly things will change today. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, for some daunting for others. It's a, it's a world of opportunity. It's a once in a many lifetime opportunity that I think if we approach it with the right priorities, it's an opportunity for every company out there. Boy, I love it, Bill. And going from that, 
that daunted dauntingness is that a word i, I might have just made up a new word <laughs> but going from that dauntingness to a real opportunity um is, is something that i know that you're helping verizon with and a whole bunch of other companies and and certainly us on, on the call now one of the things i find bill is that with this phenomenal opportunity this once in a lifetime once in a many lifetimes opportunity you, you know unfortunately because of this dauntingness one of the things that that I find is, and what I'm hearing in, in our research is that maybe because of all this change, um, maybe because of other reasons, we're not capitalizing on the potential of those opportunities because most businesses, what I continue to hear is we're trapped in the tyranny of the urgent. We're not focused on the opportunity. We're focused on today. We're not preparing for the future. We're trapped in today and we seem to be working harder we seem to be working faster. We seem to be running faster. You know, sometimes as, off, we're, as if we might be on this treadmill and we're running faster, we're running uh, harder, but we're not getting any anywhere further. And, you know, I, I love, it's not, it's not just those of us on the webinar. I mean, here's Marissa Meyer, who we all know and admire, right? I mean, she says she needs to remember not to get pulled into the fray of that day to day. And, and I believe, you know, the opposite of the tyranny of the urgent is an organization's ability to stop and think and then to prioritize. And I know that's what you believe in reading through, uh, through competing smarter, not harder. So, Dirk, it's funny. If, if you, uh, for those of you out there that, and there are many people out there that have um, uh, read Lean In and look at um, uh, Cheryl Sandberg's uh, 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 conference center in Facebook. Apparently, the one sign that she has had over the years up in that conference room was ruthlessly prioritize. And it's so ironic that it's these smartphones and devices that we are tied to and glued to that make the tyranny of the urgent the most important thing in our lives. That exactly right. <laughs> exactly. Right. Let me check that. Yeah. Those are exactly the things that are making us more productive if we use them right. If we ruthlessly prioritize, we can have it be a convergence in a way that runs our business more efficiently, more effectively. The trick, however, is finding the ways, finding the processes, and finding the tools to ruthlessly prioritize so that we're more productive and not just captive the tyr tyranny of the urgent. You bet. The tyranny of the immediate rather than the urgent. You betcha. I love it. And I know that you have some of those tricks and tools that you're going to walk us through here, Bill. And uh, if I can, just real quick, you know, that ruthlessly prioritizing, I, I think about um, uh, an individual that I had a chance to meet through, through this research we're doing and uh, the CEO of L&W Supply, Supply, Brandon Dealey. And, you know, he told me this story about, you know, as a distributor of building materials, you know, with the housing crash of 2008 and all that, uh, um, you know, they, 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 they lost a large chunk of their business, obviously. And, and then they looked closer and they said, you know what, we really have a non-differentiated strategy. Whatever city we go into, there's 20 others that do what we do. So what he did was he needed with his organization to ruthlessly prioritize, right? So here's what he did. He brought his team in and he created an analogy. Coming out of the military, he said, hey, we are the largest out there. We're like this big battleship out there in the middle of the ocean. And by the way, we're the biggest, we're the largest, you, you know, and we're, we're out there, we're sailing through the ocean, but we're in the middle of the storm and we're rocking and, and the waves are tipping us and we're, we're down there in the bilges, bailing the water and all that. And he said, while we're out there competing, what we've got to understand with all of these changes that you talked about, Bill, what we've, even though we're out there sailing, what we must acknowledge is that how we're operating today is not working. And we've got to ruthlessly prioritize to drive change. It looks like. Dirk, it's a great, it's a great story and a great example because it, and it actually goes back to what motivated me to write the book in the first place. Mm -hmm. and what motivated me to write the book is I, as you, as you do, and as we all do, we got to know, we get to know a number of companies, and I work with a large number of, of both small and large entrepreneurial and Fortune 500 companies, and I don't know how many people I see out there working, I mean, incredibly efficiently, incredibly effectively, and they're working. 
uh, you know, 80 hour weeks, uh, one guy I can think of in particular prides himself in not having taken a single day of vacation in the last eight years. And, 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 and the thing is, if he were to step back from what he was doing on a day-to-day -day basis and realize that in the market in which he's competing, the way he was competing, it doesn't matter how many hours he works, it doesn't matter how hard he works, it's the wrong market space to competing in and he's going to lose no matter what he does. Yeah. And much of what I, I, I was motivated to do in writing the book is encouraging people to step back from what they're doing, especially, for example, in the new year, right? It's a good time to sure. think about priorities and how we redirect ourselves. But focusing on those right parts of the market that if we're competing in that space by definition, we have a high probability of success. We want to compete in the parts of the market that already have high margins, that are growing, the parts that have what I'll refer to as strategic points of strategic control that we can leverage into profitability. So if we choose the markets wisely, it's not necessarily about working harder because the markets are already set up for success by definition of what part of the market that we've chosen to compete in. The old, uh, the old saying is, is in many ways it's, uh, it's about not about where we, what, what we do but what we don't do. Yeah. And too many companies don't stop and take stock of what they're doing that they probably shouldn't be doing. So that prioritization goes a long way, I would argue, and do argue in the book, towards success. And we need a process for doing that. We need to yeah. focus on what are the steps that we need to take so that we prioritize to be in and compete in that right space. Yeah, I love it. And let's, if you don't mind, Bill, let's do talk about how you can help uh, everybody on the webinar really think through you know, that process that you just said, right? What are those right markets that we should be in? Um, how do we gain that leverage and the strategic control? How do we incentivize, you know, both up and down the chain to ensure that we're all aligned? And I know that uh, uh, you're going to be able to help us out. So um, those of you that don't know Bill, you mentioned some of the companies that you work with. I put them up there for you, Bill. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, we first met, met when I brought a team down to UNC, right? where you were part of that leadership right. conference. And what many people may or may not know on the call is that you were also one of our first um, Unleashed WD speakers last year. You rocked the house, man, and everybody else can go to the Unleashed WD uh, website and see that video. But but let's get into you, you know the book and the details and to help people out, if you don't mind, Bill. And maybe to set that stage before I turn it over, because I know you've got three key stories you want to share with us today. Um, you, you know, again, I think it ties to what you just said, but one of the things I pulled out is you said, today more than ever, companies need to make choices about allocating scarce resources. We all have those scarce resources. Not only must they decide in what part of the market they should compete, but they must also adapt the right tactics for the part of the market in which they are competing. And out of everything you talk about, I think that kind of sums up, is that right, what you're talking about? With compete smarter, not harder. I think it sums up, sums it up perfectly, and there's a great, great sort of short summary of if you it, 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 the main points in the book, and I'll, I'll illustrate it with a real quick. It's not one of the three stories you just Please. alluded to, but I'll give you another another real short one, and that is one I was talking today to Ryzen people because um, back in uh, if, if you, anyone out there ever gets a chance to watch the History Channel's The Men Who Built America, it's a great, it's great. story of of the Industrial Revolution at the time, and it was. Uh, the story of uh, Nelson uh, of, um, of of John D. Rockefeller, who uh, had you know an 85 to 90 percent market share in the market for kerosene, which lighted lamps at the turn of the last century. Yeah. And uh, Edison and Tesla were, com were were competing for the the standard in uh, electricity to be be delivered to light houses, i.e., the electric light bulb um, that we all know uh, and we all see and and and. Dirk and indoor where you are and where I am and everyone out there, um, we all obviously use electricity today. Uh, uh, back then, however, people didn't, obviously. Right. Right. And what uh, Rockefeller was concerned with is that if electricity came on, came on into the market, that electric light would be... Um, not much uh, need for kerosene. Yeah. yeah. So it ruined his business model. Yeah, not good. Quickly. Yeah. Not good, not good. Um, so Rockefeller tried desperately 
to stop electricity from coming on board. He tried every means he possibly could. And and, and part of the point, if you want, it's a, it's a silly one, it's an old one, it's a simple one, but I think it illustrates what we're trying to do with the book. And that is, I don't care how hard Rockefeller worked, I don't care how powerful he was, I don't care what influence he had in Washington, D.C., he was not going to stop the tide of electricity. Yeah. So it was it, it was incumbent upon him to think about what's the next generation of his business model, not work harder stopping electricity from coming on board. Jack Welch has a great quote in, in, in one of the videos in the Mental Built America, and he says, good leaders have a way of seeing around the corner as to what the next new business opportunity is. And the book in many ways is, a, is about how to develop that vision through processes that we lay out in the book. I love it. You know, as you're, th as you're talking about the Rockefeller and the Edison and, and the like, uh, I'm thinking about today. And um, a gentleman just sent over to me uh, last week a speech that he had made to the Department of Energy. And, and his whole uh, comment to the electrical distribution world was how uh, we are at an inflection point with the introduction of LED lights. And for years, man, we could go in and sell lights. And, man, that was a recurring revenue. Right, it was wonderful yeah. business model. Yeah. Well, now I sell the LED lights, and I'm not going to have to go back for 15 or 20 years. So again, right, this business is changing. We need to think smarter about all of these uh, inflection points, these changes, and decide where and how we're going to go after the, the the right business. I love. I love that example because it really does. It's not just about what the future technology is. The example is about a, cha a fundamental change in the business model. Yeah. It's no longer an annuity that we collect every time people have to replace a light bulb. It's about those first sales and then what the heck do we do after we have penetration? Uh, the replacement rate is that much lower, in which case how do we move the business model to make money? Right on. And, and, and I know you, you talk about following the money in this book a lot, which – Certainly gets me interested. I know we're going to talk about that. All right. But Bill, let's let's go ahead. I know, you know, one of the things that you want to share with everybody is the importance of storytelling and learning from others. Yeah, I love I love using examples from others in the past, whether it be the Men Who Built America and Edison and Tesla to examples that have ha happened in the recent past, because um, what's the old the old saying is uh, those that um, fail to heed the lessons of history are doomed to repeat it. Yep. And at the end of the day, we often end up repeating history over and over again. And the quicker we can learn from the mistakes of others, the, the, the fewer mistakes we make ourselves. You bet. And Bill, you know, that's one of the things that we are really working like hell to do with Unleash WD is, you, you know, I, I believe, and I'd love your comment on this. Um, you know, I believe we in distribution have been too incestuous, right? That we've only listened to the storytellers who are within our close circle. Um, and, and I think you would agree that it's important to widen that net to learn from stories, not just with those who are close to us, but man, we, we could be learning from all different businesses, all different industries, uh, uh, quite, maybe, maybe okay. across time as well. Crucially important point. I couldn't agree more. And by the way, Derek, I'll say last year, um, I learned a ton being at, uh, at, uh, at an Unleash, uh, last year it was, a great experience to think about the perspectives that all the speakers brought to the table, and you get you guys put together a great uh, combination of inside speakers and outside speakers that we can learn from others. And well, don't tell me. To think about how we do. Thanks, Bill. Yeah. Don't tell anyone. Sorry. I'm just having a ball doing it because I get to surround myself with the likes of the Bill Pootses of the world, and I get to learn <laughs> stuff every damn day of my life, and it's unbelievable. Oh, the beauty of what we do, both of us, Derek, is yeah. that we get to learn from others and hopefully use it in what we do. And that's and that's in many ways the point of, of this webinar as well as the book and, and, and what you do when you put together things there. Yeah, without question. Ah, cool. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. So let's let's talk about the strategic use of the value chain and uh, how Soft Soap had, did, had done that, if you don't mind, Bill. So, so one of the biggest things that, that, that I've been working on, and I've looked at now about 75 firms in detail across 25 industries, and I've looked at companies that have succeeded and companies that have failed in today's environment, and I often argue that today's environment, and we can talk a bit about why that is, but today's environment is fundamentally different than any we've experienced before. And I talk about what I call a carrot and a stick approach. So the, 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 the stick of a carrot and stick approach is the use of what 
I refer to as strategic control points. Okay. And so people often ask, well, what is a strategic control point? Right. And I think that the best illustration of what a strategic control point is, and there are many, but one of the best is the, uh, the story uh, surrounding the creation of what we now know as soft soap. Okay. So I know all the listeners out there have washed their hands with liquid soap. But before soft soap came around, we all used bar soap, and there was no such thing as liquid soap. A company called the Minnetonka Corporation up uh, in uh, Minneapolis had uh, an entrepreneurial guy who thought about, well, let's introduce this new patented, what they call cream, uh, cream day uh, soap uh, uh, on tap. It was basically a tap soap that they wanted to introduce in uh, grocery stores and outlets throughout the United States. Yeah. The problem they had is if you're a small entrepreneur trying or a small company trying to introduce a product on the grocery store shelves Man. and you are at, at best successful, the big guys come around shortly thereafter, the Colgate Palmolives, the P&G, the Unilevers of the world, imitate you and in four or five months you're pushed off the shelves, they got the distribution, they have the clout, they pay the failure fees and the slotting allowances and all the things that basically make it almost impossible, if not impossible, for you to compete. Yeah. So the company had to decide, well, how do I gain a strategic advantage in a way that would give me enough of a brand presence and shelf space allocation to keep the big guys out? And what they figured is if they kept the big guys out for at least eight months, they can then get enough of the customers out there that know the soap, know the brand, and presence on the shelf that even if the big guys came in, they might be able to maintain a you know, 35, 40% market share, sure. even with the big guys in. Yeah. So the question they had is, how do I keep control of the market for six, eight, 10 months? And they decided that what they would do is they would gain control of what is a classic example of a strategic control point. And what they did is they decided to buy up the world supply of pumps. The pumps for, yeah, and so amazing. Pumps. Yeah. So if they own the pumps. No one else can they enter the market because they can't it. get the pumps. Yeah. And now it's not central. It's not the product that they're offering. They're selling soap. But by owning the supply of pumps, they were able to keep the big guys out until the big guys had the time and space and money to build their own factories. And it was close to a year later before they got the pump production up and the big guys had entered the market. In the meantime, the small little company had a year of advantage to gain shelf space, to gain distribution, to build a brand presence that even if the big guy, even after the big guys came in, they ended up with about a 35% market share with the big players in because they own that key point of strategic control. Yeah. Uh, another, another classic example years ago is in the quick version of it is that there was a, Again, the Men Who Built America example, it was uh, uh, Carnegie, Andrew Carnegie had, um, had been under pressure to uh, give better rates on his railroads to uh, people who were shipping goods on it. And finally, the, uh, the cartel who arranged buying off of his, uh, his uh, railroad lines decided to play hardball with him, and so he decided to play hardball back. And essentially what he said is, I'm going to close the bridge that gives you access to Manhattan. Or the bridge. And so he froze the bridge. There was actually two. The, the story told the Men Who Build America said there were one. Okay. He closed the main bridge in and out of Manhattan. And uh, that was a good example of a point of strategic control. He basically then took control of rival railroad and, 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 and won the battle with those that were trying to squeeze him. <laughs> and so that was another classic example. It's usually not that well-defined. Sometimes it's tougher to find in your industry. Which, bring, which brings me, Bill, Bill, if you don't mind, which brings me to a great question, right? Because, man, when you, when you hear about the bridge into Manhattan, when you hear about the – the pump for soft soap, um, in hindsight, you say, damn, yeah, that makes a hell of a lot of sense, right? <laughs> but you're, you're just about to talk about, you know, it's sometimes not as easy to find in our industries, whatever our industry is, you know, that, that point of strategic control. You know, as you've worked with these 75 different companies and researched it and the like, any thoughts or tips or tools for us to, you know, what is that thought process we might go through to, um, have that strategic control point bubble up to the top so that it's as obvious to us. I don't know if we'll get there, that it's as obvious to us as the pump for soft soap. 
great question and a really important one, and, and it's a process that I work through in some detail in the book. And the, 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 the process starts with mapping out what Porter called the value chain. Yep. So if you take all the raw materials and all the inputs that go in at the beginning of the process and work it all the way through to the end where you actually sell out in the market and they have to service and support and think about all the steps in creating value that you go through as a company inside of an industry, that's usually the first step. Yep. So you need to actually lay out how the process occurs and then at each stage of that, you can analyze the competition and capabilities of rivals at each stage in those vertical silos. And as you do that, it starts to become either apparent that there may be avenues for strategic control. Sometimes it becomes apparent that there's a point of what we call negative strategic control. So if you go out in certain markets, it's control of raw material owned by someone else that you don't own, that currently isn't being leveraged in the industry, that may be a reason why you want to go out and think about um, obtaining capabilities in that area because if someone recognizes the point of strategic control that they have, you're in trouble. Um, but the first step is usually mapping out the value chain as we call it. Yep. And I have some tools and processes in the book that we work through to do it. And then once you've done that, you think about in that value chain where the margins are at each point in the value chain where the points of strategic control might be, and some of it is often speculative, but you think about where it is and clearly where it isn't, and then you often will want to compare that to where you currently are competing. And when I work with companies and work through that exercise quite often, I will work through the exercise and the company will find out that they actually were competing in the wrong space to begin with, huh. and it leads to a number of divestitures. Interesting, so they've gone into the process to look for strategic control, and uh, an outcome of that is is the realization that they've been competing over in this space, and if they're really going to follow the money, this process has helped them identify that the money really is flowing somewhere else. And that's exactly right. And that's the objective. If you think about it, and and, and to to everyone out there, Dirk talks about following the money, and and many of you have heard, and I talk in the book about what people have referred to as the the Willie Sutton rule, when Willie Sutton was a bank robber, and um, he apparently was asked, although I understand there was a reporter that really said this, it wasn't Willie Sutton, but the, the way the story goes is that Willie Sutton was asked, um, why do you rob banks? And he looked at them incredulously the and said, well, that's where the money is. Yeah, right. uh, and good companies, I argue, have a single-minded obsession, obsession with following the money. And so if you think about where you want to compete in that value chain, you want to know where the margins are, so you want to compete in those areas with high margins and not compete in the areas that are getting squeezed inside that, that, that value chain and have low margins, and you want to think about where you can leverage and extract vis-a-vis -vis something like the strategic control point in the soft soap or uh, Vanderbilt examples. And if you can find ways where you can own those strategic control points, you can then leverage those margin opportunities at that point in the value chain and others. And in doing that, by focusing on the areas of high margin and high points of strategic control to the extent that they exist, you can then take away parts of the market that you are competing and think seriously about whether or not you should be in that space. And that's kind of the, 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 the title of the book is Compete Smarter, Not Harder. If yeah. you're in the part of the market that someone else owns a, a key strategic control point and the margins are low, I don't care how hard you work, you're not going to succeed. No doubt. And so I'd much rather have everyone step back, think carefully about where they're competing, and then mm -hmm. go after working hard, um, rather than working hard <clears> at the part of the market <throat> continue to fail. You bet. You know, I love to to that point. I love one of the, you know, the lessons in in the book, and I'll, I put it up on the screen. That this is you talking. It's amazing how many companies and how many people you see who are working effectively out there, right, in the market space, without realizing that all of their work is fruitless. That's a pretty damn strong statement, by the way. Right, that all of their work yep. is fruitless. No matter how well they compete, they are doing it in vain. If someone else can squeeze their margins through the owner of strategic control points. So, so, so I'll I'll throw out a current example. One I was talking about just today, and I often hold hold up. And Dirk, I know you've heard me say this, and I mentioned it earlier. I often hold up Google as a classic example. They are playing big time. I just saw today um, some announcements about them expanding their capabilities in the um, um, in fiber optics and, and Wi-Fi. And so they've now been experimenting with delivering nearly free uh, internet service and eventually expanding it from 
wired internet service to Wi-Fi service. Amazing. And the Google Project Glass, for those of you if you haven't seen it, go out, just Google, Google Project Glass. Yeah. And um, you'll see a little thing that looks like that. I actually got my own uh, version of that last week. So I've been able to play around with it and test it a bit. Uh, but in the future, mobile phones as we know it now, and it's actually much sooner than we think, the iPhone that we lose uh, and leave in the taxi cab or the restaurant or wherever is going to be obsolete much quicker than we think. We are going to wear them in the not too distant future. Yeah. It could be a pair of glasses like you see up there, which is the current version of Google Glass, and it's Google Glass, not glasses, because you'll see there's one little glass on there. Uh, in front of you. Uh, interesting. But what it is basically is a pair of glasses that you wear on your face. It could be a pair of regular eyeglasses as we know them now. It could be something you wear on your sleeves, a watch that transmits an image. Uh, there's a company in the UK that is now able to embed moving images inside of a contact lens. So it could be a contact lens that we're wearing that we see images in a heads-up display. But imagine being in your house and getting a phone call and doing a video call and then walking out um, with a video call on one side of the screen, your current game that you're watching, the, a football game or a basketball game on another portion of the screen, and you walk out your house, out of your house. Now imagine two scenarios. One, you walk out the house, and the second it walks out the house, the signal drops. And you lose both the call and the game yeah. because your Wi-Fi in your house provided by your internet provider um, drops, and you somehow have to make a connection to your... I, your um, your cell provider, i.e. Verizon in this case, Yep. Um, and then you have to all reconnect and go through this whole process. It's not a very convenient thing to have. Well, the vision that Google has is whereby you have always on, ubiquitous, omnipresent, ultra high speed Wi-Fi capabilities that if you're in the home, the top of a building, out in the streets, in the city, in the car, Wi-Fi will always interconnect you. And imagine that environment. So imagine you wear these glasses, a pair of glasses as you normally wear uh, at, at home, and you have the ability in images embedded in that glass to either turn on or turn off phone calls, video calls, messaging about down subway services, the game that you want to watch so you know what's going on, and it's always interconnected. Think about what that does to the business model of Verizon Wireless, uh, Comcast Cable, of any company providing content to you, all of a sudden I don't need them anymore because I get everything through Google. You bet. Google supplies the glass, the operating system, the internet provision, um, all of that bundled together in a way that is incredibly competitive. And now I think about who I'm competing with. If I'm a cable operator, if I'm a, uh, a cellular telephone company, if I'm a wired uh, landline provider. All of a sudden my business model changes and that will change much, much quicker than we think. Ask BlackBerry five years ago if they thought their model was going to be usurped by Apple who's making these silly iTunes things. They would never have said it. If you ask, oops. I got sorry, it. Built. Screen. There we go. Sorry about that. Yeah, my no. screen, uh, the lights went down. But the model's changing so much more rapidly than <clears> we think it is ever in the history of the planet. And so the, the, the point in many ways of competing smarter is if we're in the if we're in the cell phone business, if we're in the tower business, if we're in the in internet content provision, if we're CBS or NBC or Netflix or, uh, or or the old blockbuster model, all of it is changing so rapidly that we have to think very carefully about where we compete. We have to follow the money. We have to be sure we're competing in the right parts of the value chain, and we have to apply a very, very rigorous process to it to ensure that we're competing in the right parts of the market, rather than being a company that is the equivalent <clears throat> of, uh, of Rockefeller trying to stop the, 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 the tide of electricity from happening to keep his business model afloat. You betcha. Hey, Bill, phenomenal. By the way, offline, I'd love to hear about that moment you opened up the box with the Google Glass. That must have been very I cool. I have pictures to show you. I'd love to see it, man. I'd share them. I'd love good. to see it. You know, <clears throat> one of the things that's going through my mind is, you know, these examples of Vanderbilt and Google and and, and then Soft Soap, you know? Um, <clears throat> you, you know, as we think about this process, I can think about the Vanderbilts and the Googles with you know, when we talk about constraints of resources, some on the 
webinar might be thinking that, you know, those companies don't have the constraints that, that we do, if you will. But then I think about Soft Soap and the Minnetonka Corporation and, you know, relatively smaller organizations, certainly competing against the Procter & Gamble's of the world. And what I just want everybody on the phone or, or on the call to think about is, you know, these processes and tools and these examples aren't just reserved for the Googles of the world. Um, all of our businesses, no matter what size, no matter what industry, can take these same principles that you're describing um, about, you know, finding that points of strategic control and, you know, what are the right markets that we should be competing in? I think it's important for us to acknowledge, right, Bill, that what you're talking about, it's really not reserved for the Googles or the Vanderbilts of the world. It's for all of our businesses, no matter the size of the markets that we're playing on, playing in. Is that fair? Yeah. What an absolutely uh, great and important point, and, and I, I often argue and argue in a couple places in the book that it's even more important for the smaller organizations because the, the Amazons, the Googles, the Apples of the world, they can afford failures. I have a classic diagram of well the, uh, examples of Apple failures over the years, and they can absorb a failure. Some of us out there, most of us out there, get one shot. Yeah. We get one shot to, that, to access to the venture. Yeah, those are examples of those. Those yeah. failures, these were all Apple failures. Yeah. And, you know, Apple can afford that. Yeah. Most of the people out there in organizations that aren't as big as Apple can't afford, you know, one failure. One failure and you're gone. Right. And I work a lot with entrepreneurial organizations, uh, innovators, uh, people who are <clears throat> applying for venture capital funding or, you know, going to the PE market. And, and when they do that, the issue is, okay, how do we move as quickly as we can to cash flow positive? How do we get the ability to earn money inside that space in which we're operating. And at the end of the day, it's all about prioritizing. Because if we go after the wrong market space and we're a small organization and we get squeezed by an Amazon, by a Google, by someone else like that, we don't get a second shot. And then the flip side of it, Derek, I'll say, which I think is really important, if we think about points of strategic control, I want to recognize as a small entrepreneur or small organization, when I'm competing in the market, and there is a bigger player in that market or another player in the market yep. that might have the potential to gain strategic control. Because I'm worried about my future in that case. And I can right. very carefully about whether or not um, I, I, I can effectively compete in the market. An example I give in the book is one of um, a publishing uh, a, a few years back where there were smaller <clears throat> players in the distribution end of it that got basically um, uh, absolutely uh, destroyed by the publishing arms of the larger larger uh, um, players in the business because they didn't realize that they either needed to gain scale and grow to bring costs down or find something else to do, uh, do for a living. And so a long-winded way of saying, uh, I would argue that your point is exactly right, that if anything, this becomes all the more important for the small player to recognize where those points are, either to take advantage of it in the case of soft soap, <clears throat> or to recognize how to grow in the case of the distribution uh, uh, and uh, publishing business going back ooh, maybe 10, 10, 15 years ago, or in some cases to realize when I have to exit the market, if I realize that it really doesn't have a long-term viability, there isn't a long-term vi viability of my business model in this market. Yeah, Crucially love important. it. Love it. Great, great insight. Thank you for that. So once we, you know, find these uh, points of strategic control by mapping out the value chain, and once we you know, start thinking about what are the right markets and the segments to, to focus on. I know one of the next parts of your process is the importance of taking that thought process from maybe the 30,000 foot view and keep narrowing it down. Now we've got to start finding some of the right customers. Um, and, and I know you've got some stories and some processes to help us think through how do we go from finding that right market to the right customers and the like. Yeah, so one of, one of the stories I tell in the book, and I often hold up Nike as an example, it's another former client of mine um, when I was in the UK, and Nike is an example of a company I think is, does a great job following the money, and they have a single-minded obsession with following the money. And so there's a, there's a story I tell in the book, and I always want to make sure I give credit to a friend of mine who uh, uh, is an ex-speed skater, a guy by the name of Cam Tipping, and he, um, he uh, tells a story, and this is one that I repeat in the book, of um, when he first saw a pair of Nikes. And Nike came on board, Phil Nike started with, with his coach, and they actually started selling sneakers of another company through Blue Ribbon Sports in the back of a, a, a station wagon. Yeah. And uh, they came out with, um, uh, with a new product in the market, and a long story short, essentially what it was is they had the first 
synthetic nylon shoe on the market. Before they came on board, Adidas and Puma in running shoes were leather. The canvas in basketball shoes were, I mean, Converse in basketball shoes were, were um, uh, canvas material. Hey, and Bill. Comes this up. Bill. Sorry, when I was reading that, when I was reading that in the book, sorry to interrupt. This has nothing to do with your story. When I was reading that story in the book, I, I thought about these blue suede Converse shoes that I had bought before. Yeah. Not, well, not hopefully they were Carolina blue. What's that? Hopefully they were Carolina blue. They were Carolina blue, man. But right. as soon as those things got wet, my socks became Carolina blue as well. <laughs> so there was a need That's for innovation. Exactly right. There was a need yeah. for innovation. And this is a great story for innovation and, and, and how you prioritize customers to make it work. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so, so at that time, along comes Phil Knight and his coach to introduce this product that was uh, had a couple of different things about it. So the way um, Cam tells the story is he was training, uh, he was a four-time Canadian national champion, training for the Olympics at the University of Alberta yeah. up in Edmonton, uh, Canada. And the first time he, uh, he saw a... Uh, up here in Nikes, apparently what they had done is they were training at the university and the gym doors closed at 10 o'clock at night. And he was coming out of the shower, just finished up, um, nothing on but a towel wrapped around his waist. And he w went around the corner and around the corner there were a um, group of guys, one guy in the middle with a bunch of guys huddled around him. And for those of you out there who have spent time in a men's locker room, this is not a common sight. No, no. <laughs> exactly. No. Uh, and so he kind of said, hey, guys, what's up? And the guy in the middle held up his first pair of Nikes, and everyone busted a gut laughing. You're going to put that thing on your feet, and you're going to trust your feet to a pair of Nikes? And um, these little flimsy things. What was different about them is they were the funky-looking color with the synthetic nylon, and then they had the little waffle soles, so they absorbed the shock. And long story short, a couple months later, they saw the guy out on the track, and he was still wearing these funny-looking, funky-looking colored things on um, on his feet. And they asked, well, how many have you been through? Is it your third or fourth pair? And like you with a, with a, with a Converse dirt, yeah. um, apparently this guy said, no, it's my first pair. They're great. They're still absorbing the shock. I don't have to worry about shin splints or stress fractures or my knees. They um, are lighter on my feet. They breathe. When they get wet, they just roll. The material rolls off. And before you knew it, this group of premier athletes were sold on a pair of Nikes. Wow. But like Willie Sutton, Phil Knight understood that at the end of the day, it wasn't the group and pockets of premier athletes throughout North America that they were selling to that was going to make them a lot of money. It was the mass, you and I, everyone else. And so they became uh, essentially an international uh, sensation. It was the Olympics in Montreal where they really became first known. And as a long-distance runner by the name of Lassi Viren, the first long distance runner in something like 40 years to win the long distance double. They let him do the victory lap with the world watching backwards in Olympic Stadium in Montreal. And what, he, what did he do? Well, he put on his pair of Nikes with these funky looking colors and put them on his hands. Wow. Dancing around the track with the world watching. Wow. Before you knew it, every single person in the world, male or female, wanted some of these funny looking things on his or her, not hands, but feet. Nike was born. They Love did the it. same exact thing with Tiger Woods in golf, with Michael Jordan in basketball, and it's called the beachhead strategy. Yeah, so you talk about this thing called the beachhead strategy. So what, what, is, what is a beachhead strategy, Bill? So the beachhead strategy is knowing where your eventual market is and picking and choosing the first set of customers that give you entree to that ultimate group that you're after. Okay. And I think in some ways it's best illustrated by the counter example I talked about in the book, and that was Nike. Uh, actually, that was Reebok. Yes. So the counter to Nike was Reebok, and Reebok came onto the market. Some of you may remember Reebok was first known in women's aerobics. Yeah. It was almost like a uniform. If you're going to do women's aerobics, you got to show up in your pair of Reeboks with a little. They used to have those little tennis ball things in the back of them. The the little terry cloth balls that jingled at the back and the inside that was really soft. It sounds and, like um, you've been in some of those aerobics classes, Bill. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you don't want to see me watch me in those. I'll tell you that. They're, <laughs> they're funny. Um, and some of you may remember, it wasn't, even, it wasn't even step aerobics. Some of them were called step Reebok. Huh. What was the problem with that as a beachhead strategy? Too limited. 
Well, too limited, and in addition to being too limiting, it's even worse than limiting yourself to males or females. If you're 16 or 17, year olds, 17 years old, the last thing you want to be caught dead in, male or female, the last thing you want to be caught dead in is what your mom you're is wearing. wearing to her aerobics class. Right. And so you're walled off the mass market that you're going after by the success of that beachhead. And so the beachhead strategy is a strategy that you want to try and target so that when they adopt your product, it is almost automatic that you start to move to the real ultimate goal. And that prioritizing the sequencing of customers is part of the process to introduce a, uh, a new product. And Dirk, you talked about earlier about small versus large companies. Yeah. That prioritization becomes all the more important. Nike wasn't what it is now. In a large part, it became what it is now because it prioritized the customers when it was a small little entrepreneurial two-person startup 30 years ago. You bet. Wow. Love it. So any tips as to how, you know, how, how did Nike or, you know, where did Reebok go wrong? And, you know, how, how do you identify, you know, those first customers um, that you, quote unquote, you know, that, that will throw the chips in? That, you know, these are who we want to go after for our first customers, for all the benefits that will follow um, and the sequencing of customers. How, how, how does a company identify those first customers to, to make that beachhead strategy around? So, Dirk, I'm going to answer that question a little bit in, in, in the reverse, and that is many companies start to think about, and some of you out there may have heard um, the expression, think right to left, not left to right. Yeah. And what, what that means is in the book, I have a, a, a little diagram that I love. It's one that came from the Future Strategy Group, a group up in Glastonbury that does some future-oriented work that's, that's, that's quite good. And it's a diagram of incrementalism versus forward thinking. And the idea is, what's your time horizon first? So we need to know if we're you know, short-term, long-term. We want to know if the time horizon is three years, five years, ten years, whatever it may be, and that's industry, industry dependent. So in, in consumer products, good time horizon may be 18 months. Uh, for one of my big clients, Boeing Company, Boeing may be you know, 15, 20 years. Yeah. Uh, and, and so the time horizon is very ind industry dependent. But as you think about what the long-run objective is in the market, where you want to be in that, within that time horizon, first you need to figure that out. And that's what we work through in the book in terms of thinking about a process of segmenting the market to get at the right customers. And once you decide on that long-run goal, you need to think about the steps you can work back from that long-term goal in the next couple of months to get to, or the next couple of years to eventually get to the long-term goal. There's a diagram I have in the book that is Mike Thayman, uh, the CEO of Owens Corning, another company that I know well and work with a lot. Um, he calls it the green dot diagram. And the green dot, I love that expression, is the end point that you want to be in that horizon. And always find that first yeah. and then work back from that to the steps you need to take to get there rather than think, okay, what's the next set of customers that we love get it. to? And all too often entrepreneurs are thinking about that next step because they got to keep the cash flow going. Right on. they got to move the cash flow forward as much as you can to keep the doors open. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if, it, if you don't get to the right end spot. And that's why I say think right the left, that is from the long term, in a in a timeline back to the present, rather than left to right, thinking from today into the future, and that's one real good constructive way of starting to think about what the beachheads might be, because you start by knowing what the end customer We're, set is. You bet. Yeah. You bet. Brilliant, Bill. Thank you. Hey, we've got about ten minutes left here, and if anybody has any questions, you know, feel free to type them into the um, chat box there, and, and and we'll get them. But let's so. So we've identified the um, str strategic control points in the right markets. You've helped us think through this beachhead strategy in the green dot diagram, right? To think right to left, to understand where we want to end up and, you know, to help us choose which customers we want to go after. And then I know another key uh, aspect of competing smarter, Bill, is, is the importance of aligning incentives. So let, let's talk about, let's end with your observations relative to the importance of aligning incentives, if you don't mind. So, so there's one good one, and it's one I talk about a lot in the book, and it's kind of the carrot associated with the stick. So the yeah. stick is leveraging those points of strategic control to get cool. better margins in the channel. The carrot is that incentives that we, we, we set up 
And there are many examples. Siemens One has done it with hospitals. John Deere, a uh, company I've worked with and continue to work with, has done a great job when they introduced tractors into, into the mass market. Um, Apple wins uh, supply chain. Um, Ionizer Bush in distribution. But the example I'll share with you um, in a short version of one, I go into some detail in the book, is yeah. one that was uh, from Procter & Gamble a number of years ago. And this was uh, an example that John Pepper, a former CEO and chairman of the company, had gone into great depths when uh, I was at the Yale School of Management a number of years ago. And it was uh, at the beginning of what is now become the key account system in many organizations mm -hmm. and is in many ways the heart of what's happening in a number of, uh, 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 of distribution-based and um, uh, supply chain-based uh, incentives uh, uh, today, some 20 years later. And I go back to 1990 when uh, uh, inventory management in many ways was warehoused, shipped, just in time was just starting to become yeah. a buzzword that we now know uh, 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 obviously quite well. But the, the, the short version of the long story that I tell in the book, p g had gone to Walmart and suggested to Walmart that they uh, manage Walmart's inventory of p g products and use the scanners in the store to keep track of inventory and tell at any Walmart store p g was going to set up a pre-specified stock level that if a stock level at a specific Walmart store in a part of the country had gone below that stock level, P&G would then show up just in time to the loading dock of that store so Walmart never or almost never runs out of product for P&G. Yeah. The benefit for Walmart is obviously not running out of stock, but more importantly, it would no longer, at least at the time, have to warehouse P&G product. Mm -hmm. And at the time, uh, Procter & Gamble had estimated that Walmart's inventory holding cost, most expensive part of doing business for many retailers, yeah. the inventory holding cost on P&G products would be reduced by about 60%, wow. something that roughly was realized in practice because it's showing up just in time rather than being warehoused sure. at Walmart. So if we think about the key parts of this, and the, the, the real lesson to learn here and to take away is that as a result of this being put into place at the time for just P&G, and only P&G products at Walmart stores is Walmart's incentive structure just changed. So we think about the margins that Walmart sees, the effective margins that Walmart sees on P&G products. They've gone essentially over time where Walmart's, if you take the, the, whole, the, the retail price that, um, that Walmart sees for P&G products, you subtract off the wholesale price, and now all of a sudden your inventory holding costs are no longer there. So the margins that Walmart sees on P&G products and only P&G products just went through the roof. Absolutely. So what's Walmart's incentives after this is put into place? Well, it wants to sell P&G product. It wants to sell more P&G products. It wants to take P&G products and right. put it in the front of the store so everyone sees it when they walk in. It wants Unilever products in the back of the store where no one sees. You I'm bet. exaggerating, of course. Sure. But but P&G has taken a behemoth like Walmart and perfectly aligned its incentives through a joint investment, something we call asset specificity, asset specific to the relationship, and align the incentives so that P&G can watch Walmart doing what's in P&G's interest, and P&G will know that Walmart will do it because it's in Walmart's interest to do what's in P&G's best interest. Interesting. It's the margin to hire. You bet. And, and the, the couple comments, Dirk, just to close the loop on this, Please. I know many people when they hear the story will immediately ask, well, isn't this something that Walmart would push down to other manufacturers? And the answer is, of course, yes. Yeah. And a question I asked to John Pepper at the time, well, what are you doing? Well, I said, what we're doing is while the others are trying to break into the Walmart system, we're launching it at Kmart and the other retailers. And then on, as they try and break into Kmart, we're one step ahead. At, and it took almost the entire decade of the 1990s before competitors caught up to where P&G was in the supply chain. You take a small, low margin industry like packaged goods and take a, 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 a small competitive advantage throughout the entire decade, even though it eventually dissipate and Walmart will push back, I'll take that advantage every time. You betcha. And so the lesson here in terms of aligning incentives, I would argue, is often an investment that's joint will align the incentives of both parties in a way 
that we don't have to merge, we don't have to do extensive and elaborate joint ventures. We can use distribution, we can use supply chain through joint investments yeah. to align incentives. And when you combine that with those strategic control points we mentioned earlier, it's an extraordinarily powerful technique for gaining competitive advantage in the markets of today. You know, Bill, I, I actually I, I love that story. And you know, a couple things go through my mind is that um, and, and I know in the book you talk about how P&G and Walmart made that happen, where P&G, you know, rented space down in Bentonville, office space, and they brought three of their best people down there. And then they Walmart brought in three of their best people and they hashed this stuff out. Um, what that in my mind is I'm thinking that through is both companies have to come to that organization with, um, you, you know, strong capabilities, if you will. But then there also has to be tremendous trust, I believe between these two parties. And um, I think about a CEO that I was sitting down talking to and, you know, he's talking to me about his suppliers and how the suppliers that he represents as a distributor, you know, don't get it. And that, um, you know, so I asked him the question, I, I, I said, to what degree um, do you trust your suppliers, right? Mm -hmm. You know, if there's going to be any type of joint investment and there's got to be this degree of trust. And, you know, what he said was he has very little trust in his suppliers. And obviously this type of a relationship could never work in that type of environment. But uh, just your thoughts on that. I, 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 it's obvious that trust has got to be strong here. Um, what, what, what a great point. I couldn't agree more. Um, and, a, and a really great story and example. What I, what I often say is that, I, and I sometimes refer to this and you read it in the book, and I call it the Barney relationship. Yeah. People often think about relationships for the sake of the relationships and rely on the, the goodwill, the, 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 the relationship we've had over the years, and those can be fleeting. I often argue when you do have that trust, it's taking the trust and building something that's sustainable and lasting that goes beyond that relationship itself. That's the trick to competitive advantage that lasts over decades in many cases. And it's usually something like this joint investment that you parlay the relationship into something that is sustainable. And the reason why I call it the Barney relationship is, you know, I love you, you love me, the kid show, the purple dinosaur. Well, right. I love you, you love me, great for kid shows. We'll give Walmart a better deal and they'll walk and I love you every time. And so, Dirk, you make a great point that if you don't have that trust to begin with, it's impossible to come up with a mechanism to jointly invest. And so the way I would suggest to anyone out there that's in the middle of that, in the, 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 the individual that you were talking with, is first find a way to develop the trust so that you can parlay it into something that you can take advantage of. You bet. Sounds kind of a, a bit of an oxymoron, but I think there are a lot of opportunities out there that go uh, uh, un, un, uh, unnoticed as a result. You betcha. You betcha. Well, Bill, we are up on the hour. I think you and I could go on for another couple of hours. I got to tell you, this has just been a, a great, uh, great discussion. And I appreciate it. I know everybody else uh, has appreciated getting to know you, getting to meet you, getting to know uh, the great insights and expertise that you have. Um, the book that you have is available out there on Amazon and everywhere else. I highly encourage you. Again, everybody, here are my printed out notes from my iPad. A uh, great book, great insights, and you can tell from Bill, uh, the tools that he provides and the thought processes are just phenomenal. It can help all of our businesses. As I was doing it, quite frankly, Bill, I'm thinking about my clients' businesses, but I'm thinking about Unleashed WD as well and what we're trying to build here. And I've got notes here for our business, as small as we are. So I really appreciate it. Uh, I recommend everybody go get the book. It's phenomenal. Bill, any last closing thoughts? Um, for for the group that we had here. Well, I'll, I'll give it two. First, I want to say thank you, Dirk, and I always learn a lot from you. It's great interact, interacting with you. And one of these days, we got to do the reverse, where I listen to you and and ask you questions because I think um, everyone out there has a lot to learn from the kinds of things that you've done. Unleash WD was fantastic last year. Um, and it continues to be a growing success. And uh, Thank you. Uh, for those of you out there that aren't planning on going next year, I'll make a plug for you as well. Be there next year, um, as I will. Thank you. It um, uh, Just in terms of the, the, the overall themes of what we've been talking about today, the other point that I'll raise with everyone is uh, it's a new year. It's starting to be a new, you know, it will be a new year shortly. And New Year is typically when we make resolutions to think about what we do and how we how, how we work and how we uh, 
uh, uh, live our personal lives. And I'd say at least at work, uh, stepping back and pausing on thinking about where you compete rather than how hard we compete is at least something that I think would, uh, would serve, serve most people well. If you do it already, that's fantastic. Hopefully the book can help you think about it a little bit differently. For those of you who don't, hopefully it'll give you the tools and techniques to, and processes to go out and do it effectively. So Dirk, I appreciate the time. I um, appreciate all those out there listening and uh, uh, happy uh, holidays and happy new year, everyone. You betcha. To you too, Bill. Uh, have a great uh, final trip up there in New Jersey. Get home safe and sound to the family down in Raleigh. And uh, I really look forward to the next time. Thank you for your time. And everybody, go out and get a copy of Compete Smarter, Not Harder. Bill, thank you, man. Thanks again, Dirk. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Right, take care. All right, bye.